Welcome to Brand Talk, another way to talk. We're going to talk about business. We talk about brands that are in the news, your brand. We talk about brands that you use and you love every day. We have a different point of view. There's no yelling. There's no screaming. Just good old conversation. Welcome to Brand Talk, another way to talk with your host, Dr. John Tantillo. And now here is the host of Brand Talk, John Tantillo. Well, good afternoon, everybody. In my next life, I'm going to have um, a voice like that announcer, uh, Anthony Wellman. Anthony Wellman is our announcer. Um, he's my uh, Fenneman, George Fenneman our, uh, of uh, Brand Talk. So... Most of you don't know who George Fenneman is, and that's, I guess, part of my charm that uh, he was Groucho Marx's uh, uh, announcer. He was his uh, straight man. So uh, anyway, I want to welcome you to uh, Brand Talk, another way to talk. And the idea here is that uh, we all we want to do is talk about brands and what's going on in the news and and what i who i think uh have reached the level of being a, a grand brand and we have somebody here today that has uh met uh that criteria uh that i have uh, set for inviting guests for the show and his name is uh jerry castaldo and a little bit about Jerry is that um, he is an inspirational musical entertainer who is no stranger of hard work, determination, and doing what one loves. Averaging, I can't believe this, 300 performances a year. His live shows have him singing, playing a mean electronic guitar, kicking, leaping, sliding, and spinning throughout an exciting show comprised of songs ranging from standards to solid gold pop hits from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, as well as his own compositions. And you're going to hear one of those uh, compositions um, in a few minutes. Uh, one of his original songs, and this is the song you're going to hear, When Did You Stop Loving Me, was even featured on the Howard Stern Show uh, when they interviewed him about making of the music video that accompanied that song. And that video is on YouTube, and we'll provide you the link um, in the notes um, after the show. Uh, while not while not a comedian in the classic sense of the word, Jerry's onstage antics and short audience participation comedy segments always has his audiences smiling throughout his performance performances. Let's welcome the one and only live from New York. Jerry Castaldo to Brand Talk. Jerry, welcome to Brand Talk. How are we doing, Andrew? My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so well, much for that great introduction. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Well, see, we got somebody that's uh, just as much of a ham as I am. And I don't think he's a Taylor ham to make that kind of... Uh, who was your favorite comedian growing up? Oh, that's way too many oh, to uh, I, I, I describe. Have one, I, mean, I have one right off the back. Now, cut that out. I loved Jack Benny. But, Jack Benny. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was so understated as opposed to uh, my type of humor, which is very, very uh, kind of in your face. 
But who was your who was your uh, comedian of choice? Or your you know, book? I was uh, a, a big fan of the '60s com uh, comedians that would be on Ed Sullivan when I was a kid, and uh, sure. got to meet some of them later on. A uh, Shecky Green, for instance. Oh, but, Shecky uh, Green was great. I love Shecky. Yeah, Green. you and know, he was working right up until his uh, '80s. Uh, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's out in Las Vegas. And I think that uh, I've been promised by my friend George Bugatti that I'm going to have an audience with uh, Cardinal uh, Shecky. But uh, <laughs> he was one of my, he, he was great. Who else? Well, uh, you know, as I write about my book, which I guess we'll talk about later, I, sure. I became Let a fan of Jerry Seinfeld. And then oh. I had some, listen, before we even start, I want to say, uh, can you say hello to our studio audience here? Say hello to uh, my dad, my girlfriend, uh, some Hi. of my musician friends. Hi, everybody. And, uh, How you doing? The one that looks like uh, Jesse James there, that's Dave Antonow. He's actually playing bass guitar in that song from the Howard Stern Show. So I just wanted you to say hello to them. Oh, Hang in there. It's welcome. <laughs> welcome to Brand Talk. <laughs> Another way to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank okay, you. Okay, so so what? Some other comedians. You're like Jerry. You know Jerry uh, uh, Seinfeld. Um, I have a friend by the name of uh, Steve Cacciarelli. I don't know if he's going. Um, and I think he was involved with a um, a club out on long island that jerry used to uh frequent quite a bit and he was a fan yeah jerry. jerry did a lot of the clubs in long island and uh really pips comedy club in sheepshead bay where i actually started uh jerry had gotten there about 78 1978 then went into catch rising star in manhattan and i was just going into sure. pips comedy club about 79 and andrew dice clay oh, then known as yeah. andrew silverstein used to bring me up and I worked there for a couple of years in the early eighties. Uh, yeah. And with Henry Bolt, who I think is watching on piano. Hi, Ann. Uh, did you, uh, by the way, did you like his, uh, his uh, series on H was it HBO was one of the cable networks. I kind of liked it. It made him. It, yeah. It was, good, it was a good reintroduction. It was a good rebranding. Go ahead. Everything he does is great. The, the Bumblebee movie. There's another book coming out now saying it's called um is this something and that's just the phrase that all comedians would ask each other back especially back in the 80s and early 90s is yeah. this something meaning yeah. is there something to be worked out comedy wise with that right 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 and you know who else um i will i'm a little older than a little older i'm older than you are and uh, I uh, became friends with Alan Combs that used to do that before he got on Fox News, he was yes. a uh, comedian. And I used to That's see right. Him. I know about that. I used to catch, uh, I used to see him, not I catch, what was the other one? Uh, Comic what, Strip uh, on 2nd uh, Avenue? No, no, it was, uh, yeah, it was the one on, um, the one on 2nd Avenue. Yes. Which one was that? Comic Strip. Comic strip. Comic strip was Eddie Murphy and uh, those guys early eighties. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I struggled with, I see, I always wanted to be a creative guy and people are going to say, you're going after your mother again. Well, you know, what can I tell you? I'm an Italian guy that goes after my mother. Uh, but anyway, uh, she, they, they kind of like played down uh, doing anything kind of creative. You know, you go and get your PhD and uh, let that be a lesson to you. Be a good teacher. Well, you go out and join a gang in Brooklyn because the other guys go, oh, what do you play guitar? What do you, uh? <laughs> you know, you're from Brooklyn too. Where are you from in Brooklyn? Uh, no, well, I grew up right on the Brooklyn Queens uh, border called Ridgewood. We were the token. Okay, Ridgewood. You were in you were in Italian Central. I was in German <laughs> Central. I was the token Italian. <laughs> My grandfather sold fruit and vegetables to the Germans, to the German guys. Uh, wow. and my father was called Johnny, and it was Johnny. I need some. I need a good uh, cantaloupe. Uh, you know, and there there you have it. So. Um, uh, Can I just, uh, I want to ask you one question. I, sure, I see one of, your many, one of your many claims to fame is that 
you coined the uh, O'Reilly factor. What, what do you want to get me hit? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, hold on a minute. Sure. Hey, Dad, don't put a hit on him, all right? Don't put Forget no hit a on bar. Him. Forget a bar. Um, no, well, but, uh, that's a uh, very impressive, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, it's just, it's history. It's, uh, well, uh, let me tell you how, how I met, um, uh, Bill, we were, um, uh, at a club, club, uh, it was called the underground, the underground. and it was, ah, uh, I know the underground 16th street union square. That's right. And, um, I, you know what? Wait a minute. Hold on a minute. I recognize that hat. Uh, could you have were there been. on the dance floor, weren't you? I was. I, I was doing a lot. Peter of Allen was right there next to you. I, no, I don't think Peter Allen was there. But anyway, <laughs> he uh, he used to go to that club, though. Is, is that right? I that I did not, yeah. know. I did not know. And uh, what year were you in the underground? I just would like to know. Uh, it had to be the early eighties. Maybe yeah. 81, 82, something like that. And when the limelight on 6th Avenue was popular. Yeah. Oh, I used to hang out there all the time. And uh, to oh. make a long story short, I recognized uh, O'Reilly because uh, he was um, at that time on um, a local television show called PM, I think it was PM New York. Wait a minute, O'Reilly is dancing at the underground. Bill O'Reilly. Nah, he wasn't dancing. He was on the he was on the side sipping orange juice because he never drank. Okay. <laughs> okay, and I go up to him. I said, "You're pretty good," and uh, we started talking. And the next day, he calls me and says, uh, "That was fun the other night. Can, oh, why don't we uh, uh, grab?" some drinks and pick up some uh, uh, women and we'll have a good time. I said, sure, let's do it. I don't know. It yeah, sounds like a front one to me. <laughs> and I, what I would do is help us uh, get to the front of the line where when I went up to uh, 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 the folks at Limelight, I never would, would have to wait. The line would be around the block. I would come up and they would call me Dr. John. I would walk in and bingo, bango. It was a lot of fun. So wait a minute, Doctor John is from New Orleans. I know. Hey, uh, yeah, fact well, check that. Okay, fact check that. But enough about about <laughs> about me. Let's talk a little bit about you. And since we're talking about brands here, what is your brand? In other words, are you a singer? Are you a dance man? What exactly would be able to best describe Jerry Castalto? Go ahead. Well, to be truthful with you, I'm sort of a jack of all trades, which could be a disadvantage sometimes because sure. you're not focused in on one thing. Right. But um, as a teenager playing in rock bands, playing guitar, I started to think about how I was going to make a living in music and not have to go work in a music store or something. So Got it. I, I just switched genres of music. I started doing some comedy, uh, some dancing, a lot of acting, uh, theater, off, off Broadway in New York, and uh, never really got pigeonholed, which could be bad because a lot of agents wouldn't know how to sell me. They're like, oh yeah, he's a singer entertainer. Yeah, well, well, you know, so it's a little bit of everything, but um, the 300 shows a year that you mentioned, uh, I'm very happy to have had been able to do that for 29 years in a row until, of course, this March. And I've been doing some outdoor shows the last couple of months for healthcare workers around the state of uh, New York and New Jersey. And um, yeah, if, if you would call me a brand, I guess my brand would be entertainer. Because, like I said, right. you can't just say guitarist, comedian, singer, dancer, you know, bricklayer, plumber, you know. But but what I hear you saying, Jerry, is that it's really music is what really was your springboard. That's how you. That's your space. Because when you, yes. you you said that you you wanted to figure out a way in which uh, you could play your music, yet not. 
I have to worry about uh, selling records, <laughs> a record store, which a lot of guys. Well, you know, yeah. You know, if you had a record when you were a kid, like, you know, uh, the same agent that books me works with Tony Orlando and I was with them down in Florida last year. And, you know, if you have one hit record when you're a teenager or you're in your twenties, um, like for instance, I opened for Lou Christie a couple of years ago. That guy has a lifelong job as a singer because he had some great hits in the sixties and people still want to see him and he's in good voice. Mm. And, you know, I never had a big hit when I was a teenager or in my twenties. So it's always a first for me. It's like, okay, I'm booked here. These people sort of heard of me. Yeah. What does he do? Jerry Castaldo. And it's up to me to continually go out there and say, Oh, now he, he that was a good show. You know, they'll say, but if you have a hit record, it's, it's just so nice because the agents will book you easier. You have a built-in audience. And not to say that, you know, these guys aren't out there proving what they've done before. It's just that I feel like I'm always up against, okay, this is the first time they're seeing me. But that's fine because that's what it is. Yeah. By the way, you're listening to Jerry Castaldo. And this is Brand Talk, another way to talk, heard every Thursday uh, here on uh, Facebook Live, as well as YouTube Live. So uh, tell your friends if you uh, like this. So what do you think uh, is the secret to your uh, success? That was a great movie with Michael J. Fox. I yeah. love that. Have you seen that movie? I certainly <laughs> have. It used, to be, it used to be another title in the 1960s. <laughs> it was um, How to Succeed in Business. How to Succeed without, in Business Without Really Trying. Yeah. With Paul <laughs> Lynn. Paul Lynn. You remember Paul Lynn? <laughs> oh, I love Paul Lynn. I love Paul Lynn. Um, you know, um, listen, ahead. before, before um, I came on this show, I promoted on Facebook that I just wanted to uh, broach a serious topic for a second here. You know, it's like, it's, it's weird because I want to come on, have a good time, be entertaining and laugh with you. Sure. And, but uh, today is um, worldwide suicide awareness day, which is also awareness week. And then they designate worldwide awareness month every September. And, you know, I put some kind of disturbing photos up on my Facebook page and I know some people don't like it. And I mean, I don't like when, you know, somebody's putting up photos of animals that are being hurt, things like that. But this was a little different. These were photographs that were taken uh, by my mom, actually, when I was in the veterans hospital recovering from a suicide attempt where my neck was broken. So I have all these spikes and things in my neck and I'm in traction. And I just wanted to bring awareness to this subject because I was basically almost gone. I mean, you know, I could have been gone and I'm still here. And for the last 29 years, I've had a wonderful life. So, you know, there is hope for people out there that may be suffering from, you know, whether it's um, a medical diagnosis of depression or just the run of the mill depression or drug abuse, which it was in my case and alcohol abuse, because, you know, we all at one time or another have thought about it. You know, we've all had hard times as a 12 year old, as a 17 year old, maybe as an adult where you go, wow, I wonder what it would be like not to have to be here and go through this anymore. But you know, that's quickly dismissed. And if not, somebody's not clinically depressed for more than two weeks in a row, you don't really, you're not encouraged to seek help because we all get depressed, but you know, no one actually goes and does it. Now, in my case, if it wasn't a case of drug abuse, doing hard drugs, I probably wouldn't have taken a head first leap dive to the subway tracks at Union Square, the underground. Wow. And, uh, you know, and that was once, I mean, there were various other drug overdoses, but it was always a, a cry out for help. And it was uh, the only way out from drug addiction in that, in, in that time for me. So not everybody is like that. I mean, I just watched the documentary on Robin Williams uh, called Robin's Wish, which they just released. I think that coincide with this uh, awareness month. 
but I was in San Francisco last year and I remember going by the tunnel where they have all the colors. And here's a guy you would say, he's got everything. You know, I worked on the movie with him, The World According to Garp. He was so entertaining. He was a great guy. He, he's got money. He's got fame. Why would he do that? And only this documentary shines a light on the, um, what was the name of the uh, diagnosis? The Lewy body, uh, it, it's dementia. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, that's what he was suffering from. And they didn't even know it, I think, at the time from what the documentary is talking about. It was brain scans later that they determined this. So the poor guy was suffering and hallucinating and acting weird. And his wife knew it. And that's why. So that's a whole different thing than drug addiction or alcoholism or just regular depression. But it all still falls you got to get help. You got to talk to somebody. If you know somebody that's suffering, you have to, you know, try to get them help. And that's all I can say about the subject. Um, you know, my apologies to my Facebook friends for putting those photos up, but I, I wanted to, you know, drive a point home. And when you see that, and then people look at me now and I come off stage and they go, Oh, I read your book and you were hanging yourself in Germany while you were in the army. And, you're overdosing and, you know, all these terrible things, but I'm fine. As soon as I stop now, now I'm not saying that, you know, if you have clinical depression, it's as easy as getting better. But these, these drugs that they've been giving out Prozac, those drugs were meant to be given, you know, for two months, three months, coupled with talk therapy. And that was 20 years ago. Now it's just like, oh, keep refilling it, keep refilling it. And I don't want to get political here, but you know why, you know, the pharmaceutical companies send in the doctors to Hawaii and there's a proliferation of overprescribing. And I know people personally, they were on this antidepressants for 20 years without any kind of talk therapy. So how are they getting better except suffering uh, side effects like weight gain and fatigue? So that's all I want to say about that um, subject. And uh, my heart goes out to the few people that sent me emails and messages yesterday when they saw the, um, the, the photos and what I was posting about. I got a couple of messages um, from one woman who, of course, I won't name, but she seemed it was OK that I share her story that, you know, her sister had hung herself in her house, in the sister's house. And then a week later, the sister went and got her scarf and hooked up to the same hook that her sister had and went unconscious but lived through it. And there was a uh, history of suicide in the family. I understand their dad had committed suicide. And there's a history in my family, too. My first girlfriend, my aunt who lived with us, and it was subway train. So it's a horrible subject, but it's something that, you know, I'm grateful I'm here. And I hope that, you know, people out there who are suffering – just do something okay but um now that i've brought the whole show down no I, you didn't no it. you didn't but no. but i don't know if you know this but my uh phd is in um applied research psychology and i took enough clinical courses and i was thinking about being a therapist and that wow. never happened so i appreciate uh what you said and uh i'm gonna share something that i don't think i ever shared with anybody um it was 2010 and um not that i attempted uh suicide but things were going so so bad uh, for me i had lost my business uh friends were turning on me um uh, i really uh had very very little money uh because i lost the business i was in debt um things were not going very very well and it was i think uh, my relationship with god my belief that this was only a passing situation and like i said i did not attempt anything i thought about it as you uh astutely mentioned uh that everybody thinks about it and uh you know i was a big fan of hemingway and uh you you know that how he had passed uh, by his own hand and uh then you know as a 
graduate student, I was studying Camus and the existentialists who made, who sometimes make uh, suicide this romantic uh, thing. Uh, right. Hem Hemingway said that the only way you choose when you're going to pass through suicide, which is really a terrible thing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> romanticizing. And, and, and right. right, and I mean, you know, and I mean, he was depressed, and I mean, and I hear, and I hope I'm not telling any stories uh, out of school, but there's a lot of data to show he was a mean SOB. I mean, uh, he could, uh, you know, if you put on some weight, he would call you fat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he would attack you for whatever characteristic that you had, and not everybody was as tough as he was, you know. But uh, the point I'm trying to make, I'm trying to empathize, to empathize here, and I'm just so happy, uh, if, if maybe that's not the word, but I'm... Uh, I know what you mean, and, and thank I'm you glad, for sharing. I'm glad, I'm glad you shared this with us. That's what I want to say. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing. Okay. Because sometimes there can be a backlash too. You know, some people go, this guy's unstable. I don't want to book him. Right. Oh, no, no. no. I'm not like that. I don't judge. I, I, I try not to listen to what the gossip people say. I, what I try to do in my life is uh, relate to people People, the way I perceive them, because no matter what a person's reputation is, it's how they relate to you that counts, not what how other people what other people think about them, because that's smear gossip. So right. uh, that's the way. Unfortunately, as human beings, we are affected sometimes. I mean, I know I am being a little oversensitive. What people think of me is important of me and I wish I cared less, but you know, I don't know if it's tied in because my business and my personal is all one. You know, I want to get out there and keep doing shows. I want to keep working. I don't want to be viewed as some nutty guy who can go off the rails again. And uh, then, you know, uh, yeah. Immolation yeah. on stage. <laughs> uh, you know, what I would say is don't worry about it, you know? Uh, and there's a, there's a expression that I learned, uh, when I was studying Latin, uh, and it's illogilium non coborundum, which is don't let the bastards get you down. <laughs> so, so, you know, I was an altar boy as a uh, grammar school student studying Latin and I've never heard that term. <laughs> See that? There you go. There you go. Um, so what advice would you give um, uh, people that want to get into the entertainment business? It's a, it's a tough nut to crack, and you seem to have cracked it. How did you do it? Well, John, let me tell you about that. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> no woman of drum and drink never thanked her for it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, th there's like this pecking order and show business I've experienced anyway that when somebody's bigger than you, they sort of ignore you. So like, I've seen people like halfway up that are semi names yeah. complain that they're being ignored by the bigger names. And then the bigger names are ignored by us. Oh, Sinatra didn't call me back. So, <laughs> you know, I never, I never wanted to be like that. I wanted to, yeah. I, I don't know, I can't do it. So I have people write me on Facebook because online it looks like, oh, this guy's doing well. And they'll be like, I want to get into singing and I want to get into this. And I always answer everyone, but it's, it's almost like, it's not a stock answer, but it's, it's the truth. It's like, whatever you're interested in and what you want to do, if you're not good at it, you're going to get better at it. So just go do it. And as I write my book, I was, um, you know, I went to a good high school, Brooklyn technical high school for a while. Uh, I pitched for a while for the JV team and then I dropped out because I wanted to play guitar. But then I regretted that when I came back from the army and I went to wall street and I couldn't get my registered rep license because no firm would sponsor me because I didn't have the Ivy league education and I was frustrated. So I went back to show business and I, I started singing on the sidewalk outside of radio city music hall. I just said to myself, I don't care what I have to do 
and and that was actually a good paying job. So I did 150 a day, a couple of hours, lots of practice. Everybody got to know me uh, right along Sixth Avenue. We're working in a health club at the same time to supplement. I live with my girlfriend. So my advice is always just do it and just don't take no for an answer. And, you know, if I would have gone and gotten a regular job, maybe I would have had that pension and that health insurance. And well, the VA covers me, so I'm good with that. But I just refuse to do anything else. And then in the 80s, the Brooklyn Arts and Cultural Association, Chuck Reichenthal, hi, Chuck. Uh, he had uh, started booking me to do parks and libraries around Brooklyn and then the five boroughs. And from there, it went to assisted livings and nursing homes and hospitals and senior centers and social, civic and fraternal clubs. Then I started doing corporate stuff. So somehow, by hook or crook, as they say, I was able to maintain this. So that's always my advice. Just do it. Be fearless, even though <laughs> it is scary. And, uh, you know, if you're in a relationship with somebody, they're looking at you or their family's looking at you and going, this guy's going to be a singer. How's he going to support of collateral damage that goes on there? And that's why I guess I never got married. I was just focused and I'm not done, John. I mean, you know, I got a lot more to do and I'm here to stay. And, uh, I just encourage everyone smile. Let's get through these bad times we're going through and hopefully next year at this time, we'll be saying, last summer was just a bad dream yeah jerry you're just a, a really a nice guy and not only are you a nice guy you're a talented guy and i you know i i'm i'm loving this interview you're just you're just really you're marvelous and you know too much hold on a minute you hear that dad <laughs> i'm a nice guy uh look i had issues with my dad so uh uh we could argue over the color blue uh, but anyway and part i guess part of the reason was you, you know you're a you were a pitcher i mean i was not an athlete and smart uh, i was smart i became an umpire you know at 17. i was making money for umpiring and i was a good umpire and um you remind me of fredo from the godfather i'm smart not like I'm the other smart. guy I'm smart. Yeah. <laughs> can i just stop you a minute i want to say because my dad will love this my dad's over there he's 90 years old he pitched uh, professionally for a minor league team for the new york giants went before they went to san francisco played in florida in the 50s was a good hitter as well as a pitcher taught me to pitch and um you know, I got into baseball because of my dad. So he yeah. could have had that career, but he came home and wound up working on the docks. If you saw on yeah. the waterfront with Marlon Brando, he's an extra in that film. I could have been a contender. I could have been a contender. <laughs> yes, I love all those. those John, movies. don't do that again. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. What did you do with the money? What money? For the singing lessons. <laughs> <laughs> I got a million of them. Oh, man, man, man. Uh, I used to love Henny Youngman. Take my wife, please. <laughs> uh, you're listening. As a matter of fact, to, uh, I'd like to bring my dad on for a minute. Would that sure, be okay with you? Absolutely. Hello, okay, uh, to see. Hey, Ron, could you bring my dad over here for a minute? This is Jerry Castaldo Sr., everybody. Yeah. How are you doing, Mr. C? Put, the, put those roller skates back on. <laughs> oh, I love it. Welcome to Brand Talk. He just said, what's his name, Jerry? <laughs> uh, 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 what's his name? John, John, John. See that camera right there? Where are we going? Oh, upon the horizon. Just stare at that camera right there. Don't look at the monitor. His name is John. His name is John. Here, say hello to John. Hello, John. Pleased to meet you. My and, uh, pleasure, Mr. Castaldo. Yeah. And uh, you say nice things about my son and... <laughs> All right. It's, it's, easy to do. it's easy to do. Yeah. Don't look that way. Look at, he's in that camera there. You see his head right side? There? Not really. I don't know. Oh, anyway. <laughs> anyway, uh, Jerry was telling you about my career. 
I was uh, I was signed by the New York Giants by Carl Hubble. Did you ever hear that name? Of course. My father used to talk about Carl Hubble all the time. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Carl Hubble. Um, remember Bobby Thompson that hit that big home run? The big home run. Absolutely. Yeah, he, the, I the, pitched the, him anyway. That was my start, but uh, he had a lot of family problems. But uh, yeah. I was doing good while I was there, you know, back and forth for about five years. In fact, that's how Jerry became a pitcher, and I never thought today he'd be a singer. <laughs> but anyway, he's doing good, you know. You know, I said, Jerry, you do whatever you think you can do, and if you do it good, you, you know, and if you don't do it good, then we'll try something else. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, I love it. I love it. Uh, I heard that song. uh, uh the song he wrote, I still think it's great. He did that about, but uh, I do too. Was that a prox I do too. Uh, uh, thank he, you, Dad. Huh? Thank you. Thank you. He said thank you. Anyway, uh, so Jerry went into uh, singing, and uh, I mean, I've been to all his shows for the past like thirty years, and uh, everywhere I go, they they all love him. I mean, they they tell me, and uh, you know, and he, and wherever he goes, he's. That he must be decent as an entertainer. And I think he's better than decent. And <laughs> I do too. Well, I, I gotta I say, John, my, my dad had this little car, and when we were when I was about eleven yeah. or twelve in Brooklyn, we had this band and he would load the drums and the yeah. amps and everything and they'd wow. be hanging the window, the cars, shocks would be down, and we would do these block parties in Brooklyn. And sometimes, you know, they would get crazy. The kids would pull the plug out. They'd be drinking. And my father would, people would be fighting. And it was just crazy. <laughs> well, and as I was saying, Jerry was a good ball player. And, uh, you know, and I, I thought he was sick to it. But he said, Dad, I want to be a singer. So, I, you know, I went ahead and, you know, if he wasn't, I'd probably be the first one to tell him, you know, good. But <laughs> right. everything worked out for him. So we gave up on the baseball. And here I am, like for the past thirty years, and going on the shows with him. And uh, I think I got to meet more people than he knows that he was singing for, whatever. <laughs> but I enjoyed all this, you know. It's, it's especially, you know, my son and uh, I spend the days, you know, well instead of just staying home, hanging out in the room by myself. And right. uh, I enjoy him. I tell you the truth, that like when he does the shows, I actually enjoy him. And uh, and I told him I would pay to go see him uh, even today. But you know, and uh, what do you th what do you from? like the most? What do you th what do you like the most about your son from a talent point of view? What do I like the most about Jerry? Uh, about his about his talent. Why do you say he's as good as you say he is? What is it that he that he does? Well, so number well? one, I, I listen to music when I'm home all the time. I love music and. I judge him alongside other singers that are way up on top, and I know he's better than. But you know, he, you know, like Sherry said before, you make this one record and that'll carry you for your whole life. There, right? I mean, Sherry's worked for, for you know, for some big names, like he said before, uh, Lou, Lou Christie. He opened up for him, and uh, and uh, you know, and Sherry uh, did what he had to do, and I, I enjoyed the show. And then till today, I mean, everywhere we go, they says, we know we love your son. And, it, you know, if I didn't think he was good, I'd be the first one to tell him, Jerry, pack it in, you know, go back to trying baseball or whatever. And, uh, you know, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what are you laughing at over <laughs> But anyway, the truthfully, I mean, uh, not going to lie to you, but I enjoy Jerry's show, the truth. And I think he's much better than most of these, you know, the ones that are on top and uh, like I said before, but he's got the ability to go anywhere, any show at any place. And he, he'll do the show, you know, take his guitar and uh, the people enjoy him. And he's great on, you know, for doing the show. Well, like I always say, dad, you know, I, there are people that excel in different areas. Right. I wouldn't say I'm the greatest guitar player no. or the, what do you mean though? No, go ahead. No. <laughs> I, I didn't say no. Go ahead. Or I'm the greatest singer, or I'm the greatest comedian. But you put it all together, and you go out there and give a hundred percent, and then people enjoy the show. That's what I always felt. Well, uh, Jerry, I never like the way I'm telling you now. We never talked about it. 
I think you, you're great. And like I said, I would pay to go see you. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> wonderful endorsement. Wonderful endorsement. That's great. <laughs> that is wonderful. You, ask him about, tell him a little bit where you worked all your life. Oh yeah, then uh, you know. So then, like my, you know, our family's uh, sickness and stuff. Anyway, so I packed it in with the baseball, which I was doing good. And uh, and then I I got to meet the uh, uh, Albert Anastasia. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. the okay. barber chair. I read about in my book. The barber chair. Yeah, it's in the book. Oh, I didn't know that. They had the plaque in the ILA. There. So uh, Albert Anastasia and my older brother took me to. Uh, Court Street, they sat that I was about 15 and they got me on the waterfront and uh, they got me a book, you know, and uh, I went there and I, and I worked like uh, for 30 years, you know, picking up coffee bags, you know. Sure. And uh, sure. hello. Yeah, <laughs> we got it. Anyway, I and then I actually enjoyed it and then I became a foreman. And I had a brother of mine that wasn't working at the time, and he wanted to be a foreman. I turned my job over to him, and I went back to picking up coffee bags, which I didn't mind. Yeah, but weren't you a bookie? No, I don't do them things. <laughs> nope, nope. Want to bet? Don't pay, don't pay too much attention to my son. You know, once uh, in a up the wall. I got but, it. We got it. It's entertainment, too. Forget about being a comic. Uh, you're doing good. Uh, and don't talk too much sometimes. Are you still living in Brooklyn? Living in Brooklyn? Yes, I am. I, I'm, I'm staying. I've been home for like seven months. I don't come out of my room. Uh -huh. I mean, you know, once in a while to buy food. And, you know, but like they say, stay home. And yeah. uh, I have no way to go anyway. Except, yeah. you know, the, yeah. the, I miss Jerry's shows now, you know. Because well, we have a, I have a show on September 16th yeah, in right. Madison, New Jersey. Yeah, right. Uh, healthcare workers outside. And then... September seventeenth in Sussex County. I think it's Newton, New Jersey. So, what up? but you, I, I I'll, enjoy. I'll pick you up and we'll go to the show. Well, I enjoy the show. The only thing bothers me that the people doing the show that they uh, they have to be uh, contained in their place, right, Jerry? Like in uh, and Jerry. Well, what he means is that they were so far away from me. I did a show where they were like uh, I don't know two hundred feet away. Yeah, under a tent. So, but that's what we have to do now. Well, that bothers me, but you and, know. And by the way, I'm only near him because we've, he's been careful. I've been very careful and sure. you know, select few sure. people that I feel that there'd be no transmission. I just want to be clear about that before yeah. people start yelling at me. Why, you know, yeah. you're not social distancing, including I'm, Dave and his girl there. They haven't come out of the room, right? In the bunker. In, on, in, in yeah, the bunker. him too. Same way. Yeah. Uh, I'm hoping that. What's See, it? I, I'm hoping that this virus would end and so many poor people are, you know, dying. With, it's terrible. But yeah. I, I'm hoping for this yeah. new vaccine they're talking about and we can back together. You know, everybody can get back to what they were doing. Jerry, you know, can get to these places where he could go before. And now so, it's terrible so. because of this virus. Yeah. Oh, so, and, Jer Jer Jerry, uh, we're talking about COVID. How um, are you dealing with COVID uh, in terms of getting bookings? Are you doing any online concerts or any online kind of things? Or Yeah, it's interesting that you asked me that because some facilities have been asking me. I have my first virtual concert I'll be doing out of this studio here, um, you know, and what I ask them to do is give me the names of people that are in the audience so that I can address sure. them this way people aren't staring at a tv screen saying some random singer up there it's it's more right hard. but right. before i forget i would just like to point out that i have a brother named kenneth yeah. who is a great piano player and he's a registered nurse in iowa <clears throat> and unfortunately wow. iowa has had an uptick in covid cases yeah. and he's been working on a covid ward yeah. since march wow and uh wow. you know changing PPE constantly all day long. And I just want to say hello to my brother because, uh, you know, I love him. And the last interview I did uh, three, four weeks ago, I, I, I didn't mention him and I felt bad because he was a great, I, I he was yeah. a great piano player, but he chose the health field. And then he chose Iowa because growing up in the section of Brooklyn that we did, you know, it's like me, I'm living out in the hills of West Jersey 
And my brother feels the same way about <clears throat> wanting to get out of New York. So right. I mentioned my right. brother. And well, I, I, I just want to do, I, I just like to say this, Mr. C, you raised some great children. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I want to tell you, I admire that. It's just beautiful to see your two sons or hear about your two sons because they Thank should you, be, uh, they should be admired and uh, praised. I feel like what you're just saying. And I, excuse me, you know, I just want to say my son, Kenneth, the other one, he, he joined the Air Force for tw and he did 20 years in the Air Force. And wow. And, they, you know, he, he wanted to come. When he come back home, the first thing he likes to help people, and he and he goes. And by the way, my brother never had a serious drug or alcohol no. problem, but you know there was not clinical depression, but a little more than the normal type depression, sure. Sure. which which had him, you know, not attempting but thinking more than the average person, from what I understand, while I was in Europe. So, uh, and he's a well-adjusted guy, but this is what I'm talking about with suicide, that it, it, it could be exacerbated by drug abuse and alcoholism, but you could just be, you know, fine. You can have a good family and not have to worry about bills and still have these problems. So, and you know. besides Jerry in the hospital, he's donating his time to uh, eight people with the virus. He doesn't get paid for that part. And he, he said, I just want to do it. And I think, you know, it bothers me, but, uh, you know, someone's got to do it. Careful and do it. But that, that's what I think of my sons. Uh, you hit them in the head with the, with the both of them. I have two great sons, and they took after their father, I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh. That's good. That's you really, show me really great. Huh? I mean, but we're telling the truth. There's no lying. Yeah. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, so, Jer so Jerry, what's this book that you wrote about? What did you write in this uh, book? You know, that everybody says you got the book. I just, want to say, I just want to say goodbye to my father because sure. he's stepping on my toe and I'm in okay. pain. Go to okay. <laughs> Mark, <are> you <laughs> nice talking to you. It's nice talking to you, Mr. Costello. And uh, thank you for all the good words you said. Thank you. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. All right. Thanks, Dad. He wasn't really stepping on my foot. I know. I know. I know. There he goes. Can I, can I do a commercial? Thanks, again? It's just so sure. beautiful to see the love that that guy, your father, has for you. And you're a very, very lucky man. I just wanted to get that out. That's really... Thank you. And the fact that you brought him in there's not many entertainers that would do that you're a very generous entertainer you uh showing the audience your support team uh, you know you know the way entertainers are it's all about me yeah you are very you're you're somebody i want to take to dinner okay we're gonna go to, we're gonna go to patsy's you know what i'm saying we gotta go to patsy's for dinner you know, Sal Skog's place. Yeah, Sal Skog. You, you know Sal, right? I do know Sal. Yes, I do yes, know. Sal. I, I know him from Facebook. I don't know him personally. But, oh well, uh, we got to change. We have everybody over there today. We have um, my cousin Ron is over there. Hey, Ron. He on the American hey, Stock Exchange. Oh, How many years were you on the American Stock Exchange floor? Thirty years. Wow. And uh, that's Dave Antonow, who's in my music video. Hello, Dave. Cherry Lidl. Okay, you're stepping on my uh, greeting them and bringing them into the conversation there. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 no. Keep going. Keep going. Oh, wait a minute. There's that woman on the end there. The, the girl. The girl. Caroline, my girl. The girl. The woman. <laughs> They're uh, alternating. Uh, putting a mask on. Putting mask on. Putting, they're masking. They're masking, and it's not tape. Well, you know what it is? I, I, I mean, we're really careful and we really believe in doing the right thing and, and preventing this spread. And some people like on the massive, you know, and if you don't do it, they yell at you. And if you do it, you're stupid. So everybody's got their own, you know, thing about that. But uh, look, yeah. they're all masked up now. <laughs> yeah, all masked up. Okay. No. Except my dad. <laughs> yeah, well, he's entitled. He's entitled. 
but I always wear a mask. Thank you. Hey, John, thank you so much for those con kind words. And, and speaking about the book that you asked about, um, without going too long winded here, all I can say is um, I, I lost my way as a kid in Brooklyn on the streets and, you know, with the drugs and stuff, I was afraid, I was insecure. That helped me deal with it. I joined the army, got out of the country, came back, couldn't shake the addiction. But when I finally did um, and go into AA and I got better, I used to tell these stories about what would happen. Sometimes in the AA rooms, people would laugh, you know, as tragic as they are, it's funny sometimes. So people would say, you should write a book. And I know everybody hears that, oh, you should write a book. I could write a book. You could write a book. But I actually start compiling these notes and I try to, you know, put them in some semblance of order chronologically. I wrote the book, put it out. And to my amazement, it was like, I don't know, I'm up to almost 600 five-star reviews between Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Wow. And it makes me regret not using all of my notes because I basically said, I'm not a name. I'm not a celebrity. Who cares about this guy? It's just another guy that did drugs and now he got better and he wants to write about it. So I used 30 to 40% of those notes and the book's like 225 pages. I probably could have got away with another hundred pages and people say, oh, you should write another one. But <laughs> I don't want to do that because it's like, how am I going to top that? You know, it's like, let the book sit. I'm not pretending that I'm some, you know, prolific writer and I'm going to release, you know, a, a catalog of 10 books over the next 10 years. That book is a chronicling of what I went through, where I am now and uh, somebody that's read it and has said such nice things about it. That's that that's yeah. wonderful. What's the name of the book? What's the name of the book? Uh, Brooklyn, New York, a grim retrospective. And it's available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. But I hate hawking the book. And I never, I mean, I carry the books with me, the shows. And after the shows, I give out the book. And people want to pay me. And I just feel weird. I'm not going to take money. I'm not going to be like, you know, when you bought ice cream when you were a kid and they had the little change thing. So I, I've given out literally, you know, several thousand books at my shows over the last eight years. And I even feel a little shy about hawking the book, but I want it to be shared because it has a message of redemption. You know, that if you're as bad as I was, which again, I wasn't a bad kid. I was a good kid. But once you get into that kind of uh, neighborhood with the wrong people and you're taking hard drugs, it changes you. And yeah. it's not so easy just to come back to who you were before. Yeah. So that, that's what the book is about. Well, I can so understand your struggle. Um, uh, one of my family members, my surrogate son, uh, Patrick, has a uh, dependency problem. But he toggles between the alcohol and the drugs. And um, I know how tough, it's, how, uh, not how tough it is. Um, and uh, it, it, it's, it was so, uh, it affected us so much that his uh, nine-year-old son, uh, we sat him down and basically told him that uh, he's got to be uh, very careful about alcohol and because his daddy has a problem. Now, you might think some people might say, uh, that's not really a good way to go. And I say, well, yeah. medically, don't they say that it's hereditary? In a lot of ways? Many it's people are predisposed. My dad was a hard, rough and tumble drinker. He just stopped because he had to, because the kidneys yeah. stopped working. Right. But you, you were a hard drinker, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So and that predisposes a lot of children. So you're right. Uh, that, that's tough on a nine year old. My heart goes out to that nine year old. Yeah. And uh, well, he's a and he's a great kid, and he's the love of my life. You know, um, I won't mention his name, but those of those friends of mine know him. And uh, if you see us on Facebook, he's really a, a great, great kid. And uh, I mean, he ha he's had to endure uh, his dad saying, "I'm going to be there for your birthday," and not showing up for the birthday. Because yeah. 
he was stoned. So I I I get what what you you've gone through. And boy, I'm giving a lot. I'm giving a lot. I was just going to say it's like a confessional on the other person's part. In this case, yours, because yeah. a lot of people hear me confess. You know, the, the, there was a woman in the post office, very conservative, matronly, like you know, a little older than me, very <laughs> straight laced. And then she read my book, and like you know, she the first time she saw me, she goes, "How's a crack whore?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. TMI. Uh, too much information. Yeah. yeah. You know. So, how do you promote yourself? What do you do to promote yourself? I have a, you know, I have a, a saying: Go brand yourself. How do you go brand yourself? I would look. I, I would never take a hot poker and brand myself because oh, that's, that's very true. I wanted to do that in the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I'm a little. Uh, the people on Facebook who may be watching this and some of the groups I belong to you know, probably know me as um, an excessive promotional machine. <clears throat> Excuse me. And sure. it's not because I'm trying to say, look at me, I'm so good. Uh, look at what I do, uh, what I'm doing. That's not what it's about. It's just that I am so happy to be working. I don't want to stop working. Sure. Not to the point sure. where, like I said, I don't have a record out. It's, it's the first time for a new agent has to be convinced I'm worth booking. And, you know, as I'm getting older, I'm like, well, wait a minute. So I'm just anything I do, I work hard at it. Just endless hours, you know, of promotion, because if you love. It's not work. It's just what I am about. And, um, you know, like even some of my good friends like Dave Antonow over there. Say hello, Dave. Hey, Dave. Hey, Dave. <laughs> he um incredible guitar player incredible bass player plays woodwinds arranges I, I just can't believe this guy and you know he deserves to be there but it, it's not always about how much talent somebody has it's just what happens when things shake out in the music business where you are at the right time, who you meet, what manager or agent is interested in this. The Beatles, Elvis, they all had the perfect timing going on. He plays with some other great musicians. Carrie Liddell, his girl there, she's, say hello, Carrie. <laughs> it's like a debutante there. Incredible voice, incredible. Sings a million times better than I do. But I may do more shows than her only because like, you know, I'm obsessive and I'll go anywhere. I'll sing on the sidewalk. Right. Anymore. Right. Well, let, well, let me ask yeah, that, you. That's do about you, what. How, how, do you, uh, are you on Instagram? Are you on Facebook? Are you, I, obviously you're on um, uh, YouTube, but what do you do? Uh, is there a routine of how many posts that you do on Facebook or on um, Instagram? Yeah, the, I'm pretty old school. I, I do a lot of uh, promo postcard mailing, really big, nice postcards, which was unique in the 80s because right. when four color printing was so expensive and not easy and cheap like it is now, those postcards would cost me like a dollar each, almost 90 cents a piece. But, right. you know, I'd get my dad, my mom, my stepdad at the time, you know, we'd sit down and we'd, we'd send out two, 3,000 letters with the postcards to social, civic, and fraternal organizations. Sure. And once I get booked once, then I can get booked again. And, and I just kept up that routine. And to this day, I still usually send out maybe two to four to maybe 5,000 postcards a year. Wow. And it's expensive, wow. but it comes back to me. You know, you get a couple of shows and, and you pay for your postage and you pay- No for question. As I always say, ABV, always be branding. And you know- you that's know, our show. Our show. I, uh, I believe that's our show. Um, we got one. We got about 30 seconds. How would you like to sum it up? Well, I'd like to say uh, thanks to my family for coming and my friends. And I'd like to say thank you, John Tantillo. 
Uh, you are larger than life, as some have described. Uh huh. And um, well, let's. I just want to say once more on that subject, though. Um, thank you for allowing me to share about the world awareness for uh, Suicide Day week and month uh, worldwide. And uh, for those of you suffering, please go out and get some help somehow, some way. I know it's easy to say. Yeah. But uh, thank you so much. This has been so much fun and it just feels good being here with you. And the feeling is mutual. And I owe you a dinner at Patsy. Dinner at Patsy. Take care. God bless you. <laughs> and that's another sec. Uh, that's another show. Uh, remember to watch us next week on Thursday, three o'clock brand talk. Another way to talk. See you next week. Bye-bye.